This is All Algorithms Equal with another production. This is the top three factorial misconceptions about mathematics. Number six, algebra is factoring. Now this is something people really don't understand, and it's a topic one would think is simple enough for people to know the truth. What exactly is algebra? This is the question to which most people don't know a sufficiently detailed answer. The truth of the matter is, there's the algebra, quote-unquote algebra, that is done in schools, and then there's the wonderful abstract algebra. This elegant branch of mathematics, abstract algebra, includes such topics as Vietti's root theorems, the importance of C to complex numbers, the ideas behind groups, fields, field extensions, and poly polynomial roots, etc. Algebra is so much more than solving two-step equations with x's and y's, using the quadratic formula, and using synthetic division. These more basic manipulations make up what one typically does in high school algebra classes, but really abstract algebra is different. It is a broad branch of mathematics that is so much larger, so I say more people need to be aware of this if they are to make an informed decision about whether they like it. And between you and me, I find the theorems and proofs that go with abstract algebra to be much more interesting than these repetitive manipulations that often go on in ordinary algebra classes. Number five, it's useless, or it is only used by mathematicians or certain kinds of people. This simply isn't true. The entire point of doing mathematics is to discover the truth, and it helps you think freely and critically. Mathematics does not need to be given some application to be interesting. In fact, it is quite the opposite. It is often the more abstract puzzles and the more pure mathematical problems that can be the most interesting, simply by transcending the limits of our physical world. In my experience, doing mathematics, by which I mean trying to solve mathematical problems, is a form of escapism, by which we can be at peace for a moment and not worry about the stresses we all face in our daily lives. And as for the second part of this misconception, we must relinquish these stereotypes about who is better or worse at mathematics and who can make best use of it. The truth is, especially if it is taught properly, mathematics can be an enjoyable subject for all kinds of people. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have to worry about these stereotypes and judgments about academic interests. I believe, in fact, that as long as people teach it properly and at the right individual pace, nearly everyone can understand and appreciate mathematics to a certain extent. Number four, it's difficult because the notation is annoying. As for this misconception, I think many people get turned off from math just because they judge the notation to be annoying or different from what they're used to. People should be encouraged to think abstractly rather than focus too much on the notation of math. In the words of my personal favorite mathematician, what we need are notions, not notations. Many people get too caught up in the letters and symbols we use in mathematics, when this notation simply does not matter. And in school, a lot of the time, the exercises can be excessively particular about the notation students use. You know, a common phrase that I've heard some teachers say is that you need to attend to precision. That's sort of the new bureaucratic language that they use. But in reality, my point is the idea is what matters in pure mathematics. And so especially when you're solving mathematical problems, what's more important than what letter you use or what, you know, you know how you draw a certain character. It's really the idea that matters. It's, it's your level of thinking, really, and your, uh, the way you develop solutions to problems that matters. That's what we need to focus on preferably at, a, at an individual level and at, at an individual pace. As much as you can, you know, connect on an individual level with the individual students, that's, that's what we should be doing. And making sure that each and every person understands the ideas and, and can ideally help develop or, or discover mathematical truth uh, for themselves, or at least have the tools with which to do so. Number three, calculus is the highest, most difficult math class up there. The truth of the matter is, several fields of mathematics do not depend on calculus. 
Many topics of abstract algebra, number theory, Galois theory, and graph theory, for instance, are frequently treated as separate branches from calculus. This being said, we can incorporate some topics of analysis into other branches. Just look at Lie group theory for a beautiful example of this. But we should not buy into the idea that calculus or analysis is the highest, most difficult math topic there is. In fact, if taught properly and at the right pace for students for, or for individual learners, calculus is really very interesting and fun. Uh, just give it a chance, is what I say. Now, even more broadly speaking, Paul Lockhart, author of A Mathematician's Lament, writes that the latter idea of mathematics is really far off the reality. Mathematics quickly branches off into a multitude of generally independent sub-branches that sometimes build upon each other, but do not generally require each other as a prerequisite. And I think more people should recognize this, or at least, you know, I, I think it would be more ideal if people recognized that mathematics is a very diverse subject, a, a very multifaceted kind of discipline, where there are just so many different sub-branches that are largely d different from each other, sort of independent of each other, and that it's not one, you know, sort of monolithic institution. It, it's not some kind of thing where you must know, you know, everything about trigonometry before you start ever even thinking about calculus, or, you know, you must learn a, a certain quantity, a, a fixed arbitrary quantity of matrix arithmetic before you start, you know, trigonometry, or uh, something like that. I mean, it's, it's, it, it doesn't always work that way, um, especially when you get later on in, in mathematics. And even, I'd, I'd argue, even at the high school level to a certain extent, a lot of these topics can be studied independently and at one's own pace. And I'm just saying, in an ideal world, people would recognize this, that, that there are different departments, you know, independent branches of mathematics. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. But the beauty of mathematics lies not only in the variety of its branches, but also in the variety of solutions, which brings me to the next part. Number two, there is always one concrete answer. Many practical and pure problems in mathematics have no known solution. And by this I mean, there are indeed many unsolved problems in mathematics, for which we just, we haven't solved them yet. And there are closed problems for which we know there is no solution. This is the concept which I genuinely believe most people don't realize, and yet again, it's a relatively basic idea. It's something we should talk about, so you know, something more people should realize. Mathematics is not at all a finished or completely known subject. And, yes, there are some cases when there is no solution to a problem. And these are some of the most interesting problems that exist. Perhaps paradoxically, often the best answer to a problem is that there is no answer to the problem. And just to list some examples to which this applies, and I'm not, I'm gonna try not to take too much time. This might already be a lengthy video. But there's something called the euler mastroni constant which I talked about in the Logarithmus Naturalis video, I think in part two it was, uh, the euler mastroni constant, often represented by a lowercase gamma, and the point about it is, or one of the properties that we don't know about it, is whether it is transcendental or even irrational for that matter. We simply don't know. So this is just one example where it would be nice if there was more research into the field, you know, to see, can we express it as a ratio of two integers, for one thing, uh, given how it's defined? And for that matter, is it transcendental, or can it be represented, in some sense, as a, a root of a polynomial? And, you know, I genuinely believe people should be talking about this a bit more. People should at least learn about it, especially if they're interested in mathematics or engineering or science. It's just something genuinely fun, which people should give a chance. People should give it a chance to, you know. But anyways, I'm, I'm sort of rambling. Uh, the next point is the question of whether there are any odd perfect numbers. Now, for those of you who don't know, perfect numbers are defined as basically positive integers, which are equal to the sum of their proper divisors. 
So let me break that down. An, an example would be 6, for instance, because it is equal to all of its integral divisors, not equal to itself. So basically what that means is 6 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3, because 1, 2, and 3 are its proper divisors. And the next one in, in the sequence is 28, because we can say that 28 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. Yes, plus 14. And that equals 28. And the next one in the list, and the next one in the sequ sequence, happens to be 496. I'm not going to go through all the proper divisors, but if you sum them all up, you will, will get 496. And the question is whether there are any odd perfect numbers, and we simply don't know that. So that's very interesting. You know, again, another case where more research would be nice, you know. And it's just yet another unsolved problem that arises in number theory. And there's actually many other examples of this. I, I can say the names of a few more. There's um, the Colatz problem, and you can see some videos by one of my favorite mathematics professors, Dr. Norman Wildberger, right here. I can leave a link to it. But the Colatz problem, it's basically an iterated function kind of problem, and the question is whether the iterated function reaches 1, or results in 1, for every starting, starting value. And we simply don't know that. This problem was posed decades ago, I think back in 1937. And it's a very interesting problem. It has fascinated mathematicians all around the world. And it's something we should talk about, think about. Uh, there's also something called the Goldbach conjecture, which is the conjecture that basically any number greater than 3 is expressible as the sum of 3 prime numbers. And we don't even really know if that's true yet. So it's, you know, again, th th things I'm just tossing out there as unsolved problems in mathematics. And in fact, Dr. Wildberger... Again, that, that same mathematics professor, he has this whole series on unsolved mathematical problems. Or, well, they're not all unsolved, but famous mathematical problems. And so that's something I very much recommend you see if you're interested in, in, in the subject. And to name a famous example where we know that no solution exists, I will say Fermat's last theorem, which is, a, again, a more famous example from 1995. And that's, you know, something you can all research. Very famous, very uh, somewhat advanced theorem involving elliptic curves and things like that. I can't quite get into the details, but it's the problem posed hundreds of years ago and proved just very recently, 20 years ago, as of this year. But have you heard any high school teacher talk about any more than one of these topics? In my experience, teachers have not, for any shortest instant, mentioned that they even exist. Now, please, understand where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to blame teachers as a group or suggest that there's some conspiracy, but what I am saying is that we need a change in our society. We need to recognize that there is more to learn, more to research in mathematics, and we need to spread and foster passion for academic subjects, including mathematics, if we are to solve these problems in a cooperative, timely manner. And the number one misconception about mathematics. It's just dry arithmetic. This could not be further from the truth. Mathematicians use not only formal logic, but also a large amount of creativity and judgment in their work in order to solve meaningful, interesting problems. This, I, I submit, most people don't realize. Mathematics is so much more than what we learn in school, and it is so much more than dry arithmetic or you know computations or things like that. Mathematics is a human endeavor. It is something which we humans choose to do, in individuals or in group work, simply because we are interested in the topics, and that is cool in every sense of the word.